she had something much more important in mind, laying a foundation for the spiritual and ethical maturity of her growing daughter. And she was totally trustworthy to her purpose. Similarly, if Genesis is inaccurate about physical details of how life came to be, does that mean the Bible is untrustworthy? God forbid. Like the mother, it has a much more important message to convey and is totally trustworthy to that purpose. The take-home message for the fourth pillar is this. Scripture's purpose is to teach spiritual truth. Holding a high view of Scripture demands that we always respect that purpose and resist being dogmatic about peripheral conclusions about the physical world that come from a literal reading of the text. Whatever else is true about Genesis, it is a creation poem that provides a framework for foundational spiritual truths. The mechanism is not the message, and focusing on the mechanism misses the point. These four pillars provide truths about God, science, evolution, and the Bible that are foundational to my thinking about this topic. God is involved in everything. Science deals only with the physical. Evolution is simply good science. And the Bible's purpose is to reveal spiritual truth we cannot learn on our own. Based on these four pillars, I trust you can see how I find the theory of biological evolution is not only compatible with the Christian faith, but that Christians may without fear fully embrace evolutionary biology along with the rest of the natural sciences as part of humanity's faithful fulfillment, fulfillment of our call to be stewards of creation. I emphasize that this is not a compromised position, but fully affirms the best science of the day and fully affirms the message and purpose of Scripture. For those saying evolution is not compatible with Christian faith, I would suggest what separates us is not whether the Bible is reliable or not. The question is about its interpretation. I ask you, can anyone be so sure to know the mind of God so clearly that you are in a position to absolutely be certain that the early chapters of Genesis completely rule out the natural history of our planet that's well supported by science. Already in the fifth century, St. Augustine wrote this warning about interpreting Genesis. In matters that are obscure and far beyond our vision, we should not rush in headlong and so firmly take our stand on one side that if further progress in the search of truth justly undermines this position, we too fall with it. That would be the battle, not for the teaching of Holy Scripture, but for our own. Let us not repeat the mistake the Catholic Church made nearly 400 years ago with Galileo. Let us trust scientists to do science and lead us forward in understanding the physical aspects of our world even while we followers of Christ provide leadership in helping people come to know the spiritual truths that we have been fortunate enough to be called to. And all the while, we can marvel and give glory to God. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the work of His hands. Thank you. Well, clearly, 
I agreed with some of what I heard, and I didn't agree with, I did not agree with some of what I heard, um, which I guess is what this is all about. If I would agree with everything, we wouldn't have a debate, right? I will reiterate that for a Christian view of origins, our understand, for our, our understanding it's necessary that we have to begin with, in the beginning, God. When you start out with in the beginning God, then all things are possible. When you start with in the beginning God, then you recognize the power behind His Word as a Christian that I accept as the Bible. And apparently, as you see, there's no debate here on that. But I would say also that we have to begin with in the beginning God created. And then that becomes the issue is what does it mean that God created? And who is this creator? And what is this creation that He created? As a scientist and as a Christian, I submit that there's no need that you have to check your brain at the door in order to look at both the scientific and the biblical information and look at it from a creationist perspective and accept a creationist perspective. The scientific community loves to paint creationists as these brain-dead fundamentalist morons. They do that really in an attempt to marginalize us, kind of like the three monkeys, hear no evil, speak no evil, see no evil. They don't want to pay any attention to us. It's not a matter of, well, let's sit down and consider. It's a matter of, we just want anything to do with you. And so for the most part, we're marginalized and ignored. So I would tend to disagree that the scientific community really doesn't establish a neutral stance. It's relatively hostile to God, particularly the creator God of the Bible. Now, I would also say that when evolutionists talk in terms of evolution, Sometimes it's necessary to pin them down to make sure we understand exactly what they're talking about. Because many times they want to define evolution as change, change over time, change in frequency. Those are all nice, useless, vanilla definitions. They don't explain anything. They don't predict anything. They give no scientific understanding of what we're really talking about. And in fact, they don't differentiate themselves from a creation model. Basically, when evolutionists are talking about evolution, what they really mean is what Darwin called descent with modification, also known as common descent. And that is that everything shares a common origin. Now, in Andy's talk, he did demonstrate this, so there was not an attempt to try to vacillate on this. He did show it is common descent. Everything has a common origin and common ancestry. Humans share a common ancestry with primates. Humans share a common ancestry with dogs. Vertebrates share a common ancestry with non with invertebrate. Trees share a common ancestry with humans. Humans and trees share a common ancestry ultimately with bacteria. That is evolution as we are really defining it and talking about it from a creationist versus evolution position. We're not talking about just if things change. Creationists certainly accept that things change. The creation model very much accepts change. But the difference is the creation model does not accept that there is a common descent or a common ancestry to life. Humans have always been humans. I find that extremely biblical. In fact, I find it very unbiblical to suggest that humans at some point were not human. Humans have always been humans. Dogs have always been dogs. Trees have always been trees. Fish have always been fish. When we look at the fossil evidence, in fact, we find that that's what the fossil evidence tends to show. From even an evolutionist perspective, the Cambrian explosion shows us that there is a simultaneous existence of all the major animal phyla. There's not a common ancestry of them. So that is certainly, even from an evolutionary perspective, much more consistent with a creationist interpretation than it is with an evolutionist interpretation. So, can a creationist accept evolution? I would say the first thing, or excuse me, can a Christian accept evolution? I would say the first thing the Christian has to do is say, why would I need to? Why would I need to? I'm told the evidence is overwhelming. I'm told that this is the way I'm supposed to believe because this is what science says. But this is really what science says. So as a Christian, I back up and I say, I'm not going to accept evolution if I don't feel that the evidence really leads in that direction. Why would I be compelled to do that? And so that's why I want to lead you a little bit through tonight, is where is the evidence really, so where should you feel compelled? Okay, let's contrast the two, creation and evolution. The evolution model would state that things started out in a very simple 
level of biological sophistication and complexity, and over time then has transformed into the diversity and sophistication that we see on Earth today. The creation model would say that at the point of creation, there was a very high level of sophistication and complexity, and over time there's been change, but the change has been in a degenerative sense. There's been a coming down of the level of sophistication and complexity. So what we see is they both predict change, but they predict change in the opposite direction. Francis Crick, well known as the Crick-Watson group for, uh, for disseminating the uh, chemical structure of DNA, said once, well, biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed but rather evolved. I present this quotation simply as a representation of the mindset of a lot of the scientific community. This mindset creates a need to interpret based upon evolutionary <coughs> concept, not a need to interpret based on what they see. They ignore what you see, just remember it's evolved. Well, when you have that kind of mindset, then that's the direction you're going to go, because scientists are human just like anyone else. Rather than it being, let's follow the evidence where it leads us, which is what the Socratic club is working to follow Socrates' original ideas, it's, no, we're going to impose evolution. Remember, even though we see it's designed, even though it looks like there's a creator involved in this, let's impose evolution into this. Certainly, with the textbooks are loaded with these kind of illustrations, we see these illustrations that are bombarding us all the time. We see them, we say, wow, it looks like evolution's overwhelming. So just look at all the evidence. Look at all the all of the pictorial description of how things have evolved, and it just creates this constant barragement. So then slowly it begins, well, it must be true. Look at this, look at these pictures, it must be true. Well, let's very, very quickly look at one, for example, this is the evolution of the elephant. And you'll notice when you look closer, except for this little guy down here that they just kind of pose in to put somebody at the root there somewhere, the tree trunk is hollow. It's just branches. Well, the creation model will say, yeah, it's just going to be branches, but they don't have anybody evolving into anybody else. The pachyderm, excuse me, the, the mastodon does not evolve into the elephant, to the Indian elephant. The mammoth does not evolve into the African elephant. They're all separate branches. Certainly not inconsistent with the creation model. But certainly we see also a tremendous void or absence of common ancestry. And this is magnified over and over and over again in the families and orders we see among the vertebrates. If we look at the dog breeds, we see the tremendous genetic variation that's possible from what we recognize as a single species. We know it's a single species because we know the origin of the dog breeds we have today.